Welcome to the Rye Art Center. Thank you for joining us to celebrate the lives and art of Susan Jeffers, Ted Lewin, and Jerry Pinckney. This is Gail Roman, and I have the pleasure of being the co-curator of Storybook Animals with Sarah Mackay, whose extraordinary efforts and prodigious talent have made this exhibit a marvel to experience. And a grateful shout out to our amazing executive director, Adam Levy, and his fabulous staff. This exhibition is intended to highlight the natural affinity of children and animals as they share their life journeys through a world of possibilities. Children's illustrated literature has the power to inform, to inspire, to instruct, and to entertain in ways that are gentle and appealing. All these qualities are exemplified by these three titans of artistic and literary expression, Susan Jeffers, Ted Lewin, and Jerry Pinckney. They've shared their talent generously on many occasions with the Rye Arts Center and the greater community. I will briefly introduce each artist and the speakers who will share thoughts and remembrances of them. Susan Jeffers holds a special place in the hearts of animal lovers, as shown in her many works that include, in particular, horses and dogs. Her pictorial descriptions of fairy tale princesses enliven the written and spoken word. We acknowledge and thank Allie Phillips, Susan's daughter, who is here with her family this afternoon. Here to speak about Susan are Rosemary Wells, noted author, and with her great friend Susan, collaborator on the Macduff books and Lassie Come Home, among others. Rosemary will be followed by Trish McGuire, a reading specialist and principal of Julian B. Curtis Elementary School in neighboring Greenwich, Connecticut. Trish will speak on the value of illustrated literature and how Susan's work fits this rubric. Chad Phillips will introduce himself and share his loving memories of Susan. I uh, met Susan in the art department of the Macmillan Company uh, when I was 23, and Susan was 23, and now I'm 80. Susan died two years ago. I don't think either of us ever imagined either of us would ever live so long or that one of us would survive the other. But during those years, enormous numbers of decades through uh, partners, husbands, and children, parents, and all that goes on in, in one's life, uh, we shared one thing that was just wonderful, and that was our books. Uh, when somebody speaks about an artist, I, I, if I'm a member of the audience, I want to learn something that I didn't know before. And I could give you a wonderful word salad about Susan. Uh, word salads come easily to practiced speakers. But I'm not going to give you a word salad. I'm going to tell you something that you probably didn't know. Yes, there were a lot of collaborations, including Brother Eagle, Sister Sky, which I wrote, but never took credit for. And you won't find my name on the cover of that book, because I was afraid that, uh, that the uh, establishment would come after me, as they did come after Susan. I, However, we had wonderful collaborations on books that I wrote and books that I helped her with. We had such different talents. And when I see Susan's beautiful artwork out there, gorgeous artwork, the horses and the, and the McDuff books, I, I just gasp in memory because she was so much better an artist than I was. She really was. She was trained at Pratt. And she had just graduated from Pratt when I met her in the Macmillan Company. I, I uh, am an illustrator too, not just a writer, as you may know. Um, a more conventional one, a funnier one. And I had an ability that Susan did not. And Susan had an ability that I certainly didn't have. Susan knew how to compose a picture, particularly a picture on the jacket or the cover of a book. She was absolutely fail-proof. She made each of her covers a poster. They are beautiful. They are absolutely gorgeous. She knew how to compose. She went to art school seriously for four years. I went to art school in Boston for one year. 
This was during the explosion of all ab abstract painting and Boston Museum School, which I didn't look into very carefully before I applied because I wanted the closest art school to Dartmouth College where the man I was destined to marry and in love with was a senior. So I went to Boston Museum School and ran smack into all of these abstract artists. Now Susan was being trying to be a designer and was in exactly the right spot at Pratt. Uh, RISD would have been fine for her too. And I went and the on the day five of our, our school in, in Boston, uh, the principal of our year said, okay, uh, we have noticed something and we're going to divide the class. And the class was divided into those of us who loved to draw and were representative artists and those who wanted abstract. Now, abstract painting is something I have never for one moment in my life ever understood. We were sent to the basement where we learned anatomy, perspective, uh, etching, lithography, aquatint, all these wonderful techniques that had gone before us. And I was very happy there, as were most of my mates who were representative artists. And we were. I left after a year because I didn't see much of a future at that school. Nonetheless, Susan learned all kinds of things in art school that I simply didn't know. And during our lives together, she tried teaching me these things. And because naturally, I was not that kind of an artist. I was not the artist. I didn't have the talent Susan had. It came in difficulty to me. But nonetheless, I learned from Susan how to compose a picture on a page. And I have never forgotten it. And to her, I am endlessly grateful. What I could do that Susan had no clue how to do was tell a story. I am a natural narrative artist. And so on each of her books, we would go through how the story should best be represented on a page, how to tell a story without re repeating the words of the author, but telling something different, pushing the author just a little bit so that something different is happening in the pictures from in the text. And we spent years doing this, back and forth with every book. I loved it. I loved Susan. She was my best friend. And I cannot believe that she is not here today. If Susan were here today, her love of animals would have and did inspire me to do this. Normally I wouldn't do this, but I am doing this because we live in the middle of terrible climate change and as we all have seen on television with the dreadful pictures of what's happening in Florida, we live in a time where people and animals suffer terribly. So, if you'll forgive my consulting my iPhone for, yes, for the uh, names, yes. I have in this envelope about six or seven original G. Clay prints from the Macduff books. They are very rare because Susan signed them. Now, I can sign them too for anybody who would like one. And God willing, if unless my car goes off the road, I will be able to sign these for you if you want one. The holidays are coming up. All I ask and all Susan would ask is that you make a significant con contribution the best you can afford, which of course is tax deductible, to the following institutions on my iPad, which you can easily get. They are the Gulf Coast Humane Society, Orange County Animal Shelter in Orlando, Animal Welfare League in Charlotte, 
anybody who wants the list of these can find them under the AKC Reunite uh, email. And you can also, if you forget all about it, you can email me. You can find me on my website. And you can easily email me there. I brought these along in case somebody would like one. You may have it. Just help those animals out. And Susan will be in heaven, your friend forever. This is what she would like. After the speeches are over, I'll be in the reception area. I have a few with me. I have a bunch more. We have only 20 signed pictures that Susan signed. And of course, I can personalize them and sign them too. I have no intention of falling off the twig this month. So uh, <laughs> anyway, this, I think, is a good conclusion to what I, wa I wanted to say. Susan was devoted to certain causes and animals were one that she and I shared. She loved her horses. She adored her Westies. She loved her, her uh, German Shepherd. As a matter of fact, when we first met and we first worked together in her home in Brooklyn, we spent probably half of the time, and Reno Turner remembers this, half of the time letting this poor benighted German Shepherd off the roof and into her apartment and taking care of him because the landlord was so cruel and put this dog up on the hot roof where it, it nearly died. And uh, we rescued that shepherd. And that was a bond that never dissolved. So in Susan's memory, let's help those dogs down in Florida, dogs and cats and horses, I'm sure, who have suffered. And uh, let us look carefully at her beautiful artwork I don't believe there is any illustrator in our time who has ever illustrated horses as beautifully as she did, or for that matter, West Highland White Terriers. So thank you very much for your attention, and I will see you out in the, uh, in the room. Thank you. Um, it's quite an honor to be here today to speak to you on behalf of Susan Jeffers as an acclaimed children's book illustrator and artist, and especially after um, Rosemary Wells. Thank you for those words. My name is Trish McGuire, and I am an educator and a lover of children's literature. And my good friend Gail Roman, um, the co-curator of this beautiful exhibit, has provided me with this amazing opportunity today. I have been an educator for over 25 years and a principal at an elementary school in Greenwich, Connecticut for 13 of those years. My teaching years were spent as both a special education teacher and a literacy specialist. Teaching children to read and watch them progress is the greatest gift we can receive in my profession. It is so very important to have good stories depicted through beautiful illustrations that enrich learning and enhance the understanding of our world. For our youngest readers, picture books are an important part of learning how to read. Pictures mark the first step in introducing a child to reading and is often the start of language development for many of our children. Illustrations in a picture book help children understand what they are reading, allowing new readers to examine the story. When children are having difficulty with the words, the illustrations help them figure out the story and increase their comprehension. When my daily life as a principal gets bogged down with bureaucracy and a long to-do list, I just take some time to sit down with a kindergartner and let them tell me a story through the picture books. Picture books allow teachers and parents to spend time discussing the story, the pictures, and the words. And this gives young readers confidence and allows them to talk about what they see on the page, what happened in the story, and what the characters are doing and which events have unfolded. The illustrations are essential for helping young children to develop their imagination and the reason why children's books need to have colorful and vivid illustrations. The fact is that good readers visualize or create mental pictures of what they read about. When reading fiction texts, illustrations help readers to visualize the people, places, and events in the story. So, I don't want to bore you with the science of reading. As we know, 
reading and learning to read includes philosophies, teaching strategies, and assessment practices that reflect and underscore the concepts of evidence-based reading re research and data-driven decision, decision making. Excuse me. These are all important concepts for a teacher or a principal in today's world. But the true success is in the joy of reading and bringing the world to young children as they sit on your lap or share a book with an adult. That brings us to the amazing works of Susan Jeffers. Susan Jeffers, an illustrator who has the reputation to bring the natural world to children through her art and portraiture, delivered the gift of reading enjoyment to children across the world. Her illustrations have brought simple joys to life, such as in the adventures of the endearing character Macduff and love songs of Little Bear. She captured nature's amazing beauty and splendor in books such as the Abbey Award-winning Brother Eagle, Sister Sky. Susan is the illustrator of distinguished picture books such as Three Jovial Huntsmen, a Caldecott Honor Book, and Robert Frost Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. My personal favorites include The Magic of the Nutcracker, The Twelve Days of Christmas, and Jingle Bells. Susan's personal note in the back of her book, The Nutcracker, states that she wanted to create a book to speak to the child. Well, the magnificent depiction of Marie, the mouse king, and the prince brings the traditional ballet to life in her book. It has truly served to help many children understand the ballet. And there is no mention of Susan Jeffers without mentioning her love of horses depicted in My Pony, What's Your Favorite Animal, Black Beauty, or My Shingatigue Pony, which was based on an incident that Jeffers witnessed when she went to Shingatigue Island for Pony Penning Day auction. The lovely illustrations capture the character's love of horses the beauty of the ponies, and the excitement of the roundup by the saltwater cowboys of the volunteer fire department. Susan, thank you for sharing your lifelong love of horses, nature, and stories. Thank you for helping children discover and adults rediscover nature through your gorgeous picture books packed with beautiful, full-color illustrations. In the book, Brother Eagle, Sister Sky, Chief Seattle's words end the story with the following. We love this earth as a newborn loves its mother's heartbeat. If we sell you our land, care for it as we have cared for it. Hold it in your mind, the memory of the land, as it is when you receive it. Preserve the land and the air and the rivers for your children's children and love it as we have loved it. This message of the chief written in the 1850s is still relevant today and will be forever true as Susan Jeffers' timeless illustrations will be forever cherished by us all. Thank you. Um, Chad Phillips is Susan's son-in-law. My wife, Allie, and the daughter is right here in front. Um, over the last couple of years, uh, after Susan passed, Allie and I have had the pleasure of sorting through Susan's lifetime of work. Uh, everything from college paintings to sketchbooks, from her travels to portraits and still life paintings. Of course, all of her illustrations that everybody's familiar with. But it has been a lot to process and at times very emotional, especially for Allie. Uh, but you really start to understand what a lifetime of this pursuit looks like. The arts often have a mystique of talent handed down from the ether, but there are actually years of work honing a craft a real grind and discipline involved, just like any other worthwhile pursuit. Even when she wasn't working on a book, Susan would attend painting classes or travel to places such as Gloucester, which she loved, to paint the boats and the life around the sea town. There are sketches of people that happen to be sitting around her and random things such as conferences or classes. We found 
um, brochures and flyers from events that she was at that on the back you turn it over and there's little sketches of just whoever happened to be sitting around her and it was just something that she always seemed to be doing and studying and honing. Uh, even some of my favorite paintings are not one that I think anybody has really seen, ones that were just uh, studies done around, even just around her neighborhood where she lived in the forest, um, especially ones that are more even impressionistic, that are just in incredible light of that's filtering through snow-covered trees. Um, I'm sure this kind of work ethic can be said for the other artists that we're honoring here today. But it's, uh, it's such a great example, especially for kids, to see these works today, especially in a time when all of our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. These great pursuits take time and focus. Most can, can only achieve through putting in the work every day. On top of working at her art, Susan spent a lot of time with animals, obviously, and in particular horses that everybody's talked about. Um, but I was honored to, to be involved, at least just a little bit, in some of the last few books that she worked on. And uh, I'll really I'll always cherish the times that we sat down together and to look at some of what she was working on and have her own little critiques, whether it was uh, a book that she was working on or just a personal painting that she was working on. I love discussing just even the typeface on the cover of a book or whether it had too much glitter. <laughs> I said shimmer, not sparkle. <laughs> just kidding. But, uh, but when she was with you, even if you were someone that she personally knew, or just even a stranger, she was always very present with you. And she took the time if she was just signing your book, or even I remember, I forget if it was a Thanksgiving or Christmas, a fan called last minute and they were going to their relative's house who lived nearby and wanted an autograph of a book. And it was, you know, yeah, in the middle of a Thanksgiving dinner or something. And it was like, hey, come on in and like have a piece of pie and, you know, chat for a few minutes. Um, but she was always just very generous with her time and her attention. And it wasn't, she wasn't trying to run off and do something else. She would sit there and talk to you and look at you and ask questions more of you, even if it was somebody who wanted to see her and talk to her. She was always asking the questions and she was a real, a true seeker and and it was just a great example and it wasn't something that she was trying to preach or show people that she was like that. It was, it was very quiet and almost, you didn't realize that it was happening and I didn't even, uh, until years after I knew her and kind of said, you know, it's just, why is it wonderful to be with her and have these little conversations? And it was that, that she was just, she was always very present. Um, and it was no accident Susan lived in the woods and Allie grew up playing in the forest. <laughs> where she would be gone for hours and making her own stories about the animals there. And that love of animals was surely passed down <laughs> to Allie, um, which if anyone has visited our home can attest to, because we have a, a zoo of our own with <laughs> dogs and rats and birds and a lizard <laughs> and three kids somewhere around here. <laughs> Um, but the other artist work that's here today is exemplary of the same work ethic, I'm sure, because you can't achieve the things that they've achieved through just sheer luck or nobody's born with these kind of talents. They, they might have a little bit of a head start, but it's a lifetime of working. Uh, I was honored to have her as a friend and a mentor 
and as she would say, it's your mother-in-law. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gail. behind the scenes are two representatives from the Society of Illustrators in New York City, Annel Miller, Executive Director, and Dennis Dittrich, past president and chair of the Society's Hall of Fame committee into which whose ranks the Lewins have been inducted. Following their video presentation, we are honored to call on Betsy Lewin, a beloved children's book illustrator and author, as you will see, a constant companion and collaborator on their travels and publications. Annel and Dennis. So we're like a, a tag team, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sing, and you're gonna make an excuse for us. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, you um, talk first. Okay, I'll just do that. Hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, folks. Uh, since, uh, since this presentation has a lot to do with animals, I think it's probably a good time to mention Ted's brothers. Uh, <laughs> My, uh, my connection with, uh, with Ted began uh, not as a professional illustrator, but uh, years before when I was about 12. I used to go to the Union Hall to watch the inimitable Mark Lewin wrestle. I was a huge fan. This guy, I never got a chance. A uh, decade later, I'm at the Society of Illustrators. I'm looking at an exhibit that we had of old-time wrestlers done in oil with a, a glaze technique. And I looked at the artist's name and I said, Lewin. Wrestlers, and it's painted by a guy named Lewin. This is not a coincidence. So I investigated it. Sure enough, Ted is Mark's brother. Well, Ted and I became friends, uh, became very good friends. We. Uh, we combined our classes from separate schools. Uh, we, uh, we had great conversations. We talked about art. We talked about wrestling. And we lamented the fact that elves never came in and finished our paintings. But um, I was going to take a survey. How many people here went to art school and how many people paid their way through as a professional wrestler? <laughs> I didn't think I'd see many hands, OK? Ted did. And uh, those of you who, uh, who know him probably uh, probably know the stories. You don't need to hear them from me. But um, we uh, we did have the chance to, after uh, years of friendship, induct Ted and Betsy into the Illustrators Hall of Fame. And uh, I'd like to ask Anel to introduce our Hall of Fame video. So thank you talk now. Yes, no, I'm talking about you. Um, it's really an honor for us to um, be here today to um, speak about and to show you this uh, video that we put together when Ted and Betsy were inducted into the Hall of Fame in, in 2015. But um, I would be remiss if I didn't just um, honor uh, Jerry Pinckney as well, who we all have loved for many, many, many years, and as well as Susan Jeffers, who has always been a part of the Society of Illustrators um, original art exhibition, um, as you well know. So um, we really, you know, we, we feel so connected with these amazing, amazing illustrators and we honor their legacies and at the Society of Illustrators, we will always honor them. We created a scholarship for Jerry Pinckney and one for Ted Lewin for students this past year. So we're really proud that we have been able to do that to, uh, to, keep, their, to keep their memories alive. So we are thrilled to introduce this, um, this video. This is, um, for those of you who might not know, the Society of Illustrators Hall of Fame has been taking place since 1958 when Norman Rockwell was first inducted. And every year we induct six or seven incredible illustrators into our Hall of Fame. Dennis is the chair of that committee. Um, there is a group that, that inducts them. And as I said, seven years ago, we had the absolute honor of, we would not have thought of not inducting Ted and Betsy into this Hall of Fame together because of their incredible life together, their incredible collaboration 
yes, they each have their own styles and, and did their own thing, but their work together was for us uh, the most incredible achievement. So we hope you enjoy this video, and thank you all. Thank you for having us. Roll tape. We are having a slight technical difficulty. Just give us a few minutes. We will retrieve this. Sarah is on her way, and I think perhaps we'll ask Betsy if she would speak in the meantime. Certainly. Thank you. <laughs> Instructors, courses, everything. The atmosphere was perfect. And I thought I had everything I needed to go out into the world and pursue a career as an illustrator. But the very best thing that ever happened to me at Pratt was meeting Ted. And <laughs> we were on a blind date. That's how we met. And uh, it was love at first sight. We had everything in common. We, we read the same books, loved the same movies, um, loved the outdoors, hiking, bird watching. And we both loved animals, tame and wild. Now, growing up, I had normal pets like cats, dogs, goldfish, canaries. But Ted had a lion cub. <laughs> a chimpanzee, many, many varieties of monkeys, a boa constrictor that I heard got, somehow got stuck in the ceiling in the rafters and they had to take the ceiling down to get the snake out. And they also had an iguana named Iggy who would climb up in the Christmas tree, turn green, and stay there till New Year's. <laughs> so we had that in common. But we both had this burning desire to travel to the wild places of the world, starting with Africa. That was our first, first thought. Now, of course, when we were first married, uh, we couldn't afford it. I was barely working then. Uh, Ted was working, but uh, not, not too much money. So about six years later, I was working now a little bit. Um, Ted was working a lot, um, pulp magazines, and just every kind of imaginable work. And, uh, and I was actually repping him for a while because his rep had retired. And so one day I was walking down Madison Avenue. I had just delivered one of Ted's jobs to Family Circle. I looked up on the side of this building, and I saw this sign that said, Lindblad adventure travel. And I thought, well, it wouldn't be a bad idea to just go up there and, and ask them, you know, if they might have anything that we could afford. So I went up there, and they did. They offered me three weeks safari in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania in East Africa. $1,000 a week. I said, I don't care if we go broke, we're going to do this. And I ran out, and I called Ted immediately. And back then, they had phones on the street. So I called him, and I said, Ted, guess what? We're going to Africa. And that was the beginning of 50 years of, of travel. Uh, it, it, it really, really fulfilled a dream. We. We traveled through six continents and produced between the two of us, I think, around two dozen books. Most of them were Ted's. Some of them were uh, our collaborations together, and a few of them were mine. And you know, it's, it's funny. I, uh, 
When I started out, I loved my, my style. I loved my loose kind of cartoony drawing, and, and I could draw out of my head. But I adored Ted's art, and I, I was so envious of it. The, the warmth, the sense of place, just everything about it was, was so engrossing. And, uh, you know, I, I just sort of did, I wasn't doing very well taking my portfolio around. And I told Ted, I don't think I can do this. And he, and he was so encouraging and so helpful. And just say, just keep at it. You just got to keep at it. You know, don't, don't give up. And it, it was really funny because we really had, we each had our, our uh, little special things. <laughs> like um, I could draw out of my head, and Ted couldn't. He had to have reference or a model in front of him. So we were kind of helpful to each other. When I was working, I might call him and say, hey, Ted, come down. can you come down here and help me? And he would come down to my studio, and I would say, can you help me put this table on the floor? It's not my, my I, I just had no perspective ability. So he would set that table right. And then another time, he would call me up to his studio, and he'd say, hey, Bets, can you come up here and help me with something? And I, yeah, sure. So he was working on a, a, a painting that in, in involved a horse. And the reference that he was using was a picture of a horse from a magazine. But there was a little square tab of an advertisement covering one of the horse's hind legs. He said, I've been trying all, I can't, can't just I can't draw it. Can you, can you help me out? Sure. Boom, boom, <laughs> horse's leg. <laughs> And it was, he, he said it was the thing that saved our marriages, <laughs> our lives, and our, our styles were so different. But one time, we were doing a uh, uh, school visit, and at the end of the school visit, this little boy came up to Ted, and he had pencil, and he had his crayon and paper, and he said, can you draw me a wabbit? And Ted said, have you got a picture? <laughs> Guess who drew the rabbit? <laughs> so, um, I must say, I miss him, and uh, but 65 years of absolute bliss. I can't complain, and I have all his art, which I dearly love, and which speaks for itself. I have all our books, I have all the photographs, and I have all the memories. And that will sustain me. And I hope someday we'll meet again somewhere in the great beyond. Thank you. building in a teepee 125 miles above the Arctic Circle, you're running into a mother grizzly bear and her two half-grown cubs in Denali National Park. Ted and Betsy have crossed the world in search of stories for their amazing children's books. Not every trip has been dangerous, but there have been enough scary moments to give an editor chills. Their first collaboration, Gorilla Walk, took them to Uganda in search of the mountain gorilla. They've been wanting to make the trip for years, but Uganda had been engaged in an off-and-on civil war seemingly forever. Finally, there was a let-up, and Ted and Betsy took off. They got home safely, and the book got underway. A while later, however, a similar party, making the same trek, was murdered. The civil war was on again. Such wildlife adventures seem a logical outcome of Ted's childhood spent growing up with an African lion, a chimpanzee, several kinds of monkeys, and an iguana named Iggy. When he was 17, Ted became a professional wrestler that helped pay his tuition at Pratt. Betsy's childhood pets were more tame, a dog named Trippy and a cat named Ajax. But unknown to each other in their childhoods, each was reading I Married Adventure by Oza Johnson. Equally enthralled with Oza and her husband Martin's exotic adventures with rhinos, pygmies, and even the gorillas, Betsy was already dreaming of seeing the world in the wild someday herself. Betsy seems to have been destined for a career in children's books from the start. Weaned on Babar, 
Uncle Remus, Robin Hood, and Winnie the Pooh. Always an artist, her heroes were Ernest Shepard, A.B. Frost, and Beatrix Potter. After graduating from Pratt Institute, where she studied illustration, she designed greeting cards, then began to write and illustrate stories for children's magazines. When an editor at Dodd Mead & Company asked her to expand one of those stories into a picture book, Betsy had come home. Ted also studied illustration at Pratt, as he became familiar with painters like Velasquez, Homer, Sargent, Aikens, and the Ashcan School. He started a series of portraits of the boys, as pro wrestlers called themselves. He painted them not just in the ring, but in the dressing room. Not surprisingly, one of the first jobs he landed after graduation was with Joe Weider's Boxing and Wrestling magazine. When Betsy was a sophomore at Pratt, she was introduced to Ted, who claims he won her heart with pictures of his pet chimp and lion cub. They started going everywhere together, even to wrestling matches. One of Ted's classmates had gotten a job as art director of a men's magazine, and suddenly Ted was flush with work. Using his brothers and Betsy as models, he painted Betsy being attacked by everything from a rogue mongoose to a pirate of the Sulu Seas. His brother Mark fended off alligators with a bowie knife and made a great Nazi being shot in the stomach. Betsy took pictures of Ted himself as a Comanche warrior, an evil Arab, and a captain going down with a sinking ship. In 1963, six years after they met, they were married. Soon they began their travels, which have spanned six continents over the past 40 years. Ted was working for magazines and Reader's Digest condensed books when he met an agent, Elizabeth Armstrong, who was interested in representing him. At the time, there was a lot of federal money and education, and Elizabeth was able to get Ted a number of full-color textbook illustration jobs but she didn't think the money was good enough in children's trade books, so she never approached their publishers. That took Betsy, who began agenting Ted when Elizabeth retired. Ted began illustrating young adult jackets, and then came the big one, his first picture book, Faithful Elephants. He has never looked back. To date, Ted is the author and or illustrator of more than 100 children's books, Betsy 93 and counting. They each have been awarded a Caldecott Honor Book Medal, Betsy for Click Clack Moo, Cows the Type, by Doreen Cronin, and Ted for Peppy the Lamplighter by Alyssa Bartone. Between them, they have garnered dozens of awards, including the New York Times Best Illustrated and numerous ALA Notable Books and Children's Choices, along with all of their starred reviews. They each have a Society of Illustrators Silver Medal, and Ted is a recipient of the prestigious Hamilton King Award. Ted is a watercolor master. His paintings can light your evening with the glow of an 1800s New York City gas lamp or warm it around a Kalahari fire. They can make you feel the wet spray of elephants taking a bath or feel the hair on a silverback gorilla. They can put you there on the steaming Sahara or on the freezing Arctic ice. Betsy's great strength is in her line its speed, its wit, its sparkling personality. She can capture a mood of human or animal with just a few strokes of her pen. Her illustrations capture the subtle and not so subtle feelings that are a part of everyone's life. She is a genius at finding the humor in a situation, so their collaboration is perfect. Ted paints the big picture, Betsy tells the human story. When Ted and Betsy were asked how they might sum up their lives as illustrators, humorists, painters, and adventurers, it beats work, they said. Well, thank you, Adele, Dennis, and Betsy. Jerry Pinkney is more than an illustrator and author of books for children. He is perhaps best known for poignantly recording human foibles in many illustrated reworkings of Aesop's fables, and also heroic historical subjects such as Harriet Tubman, Washington Carver, and Martin Luther King. Speaking first about Jerry is Barry Mason, a well-known abstract artist whose works have been here at the center, documentary photographer, and arts advocate. 
Barry had the privilege of observing Jerry at work in a library classroom filled with students mesmerized by his on-the-spot drawing and reading. Barry will be followed by Rich Michelson, renowned specialist in illustration art, whose fine art gallery in Northampton, Massachusetts is considered a treasured resource. Lastly, we present Gloria Pinckney, author of children's books that explore family roots and their transitions through time and space. She is the matriarch of a family of talented <coughs> artists and writers. Barry? That's good. <laughs> I hope it wasn't me. Anyway. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Barry Mason again, and I'll be speaking about Jerry Pinckney, who is, you know, I would say one of the greatest illustrators, you know, of our time, everything. And so uh, I guess starting out, what does, you know, an abstract artist have in common with the illustrator? None and then a lot. None in a sense because I'm an abstract painter, a lot being we're still artists. And Jerry Pinckney was a great, great artist, a great draftsman, a great human, just a great person. I got a chance to meet Jerry in 2014 at the Horseman School where I work uh, as a professional photographer for the school. And so here, his work's on exhibit. And as you can see, uh, here this is in the Fisher Gallery. And his, you know, talking to the uh, young kids there about his art. Uh, hopefully I have this going correctly here. And it's not only did he talk to the middle school kids and upper school kids, but he also was invited to speak with the lower division kids. And the lower division basically goes from, I would say, what, first grade, hopefully I got that right, till fifth grade. And then the upper school goes from middle school from six to eighth grade and upper school from ninth to twelfth grade. And so here at the lower division, they actually got a chance to not only see him, you know, where he talked to them, but as well, he drew pictures as here you can see him drawing a picture or a sketching picture of a rabbit here. And although he's basically always worked in watercolor for the most part, but here he's used soft pastels to as his uh, tool for a uh, for the kids being, you know, it's more immediate for what he was trying to do and trying to say. And so there's a picture from holding the chalk. And here going back to uh, the Fisher Gallery where his example of, you know, showing kids the books that he's, you know, created some of them as well as the fine work behind him. Uh, he was just a, and it goes not only with what, you know, of Jerry Pinckney, but everyone that spoke so far about how talented and how skilled and how relentless all these artists have worked. And Jerry, with no exception, was a craftsman at what he did. And watercolor is not an easy thing to work with. Uh, you do have to really, you know, it's not like one you, you studied on Monday and your perfection is on Tuesday or by the end of the week. It's years and years and years of practice. And even as an educator myself, I always teach my students that you got to constantly work at it, whether you be an artist, a lawyer, a chef, uh, the videographers in the back there. They have to work. You have to work at your craft and day in and day out. And Jerry worked at his craft day in and day out. Here, back to the lower division where he's, you know, read one of the books to, you know, the students there. And with all the students, they would ask questions to him, you know, for whatever it is that would cross their mind. And everybody knows if you've been around little kids, some of the things that come up, you know, that they'll ask you out of the blue that will really take you off guard. But, you know, Jerry, you know, as humble and as endearing as well as just, a person who loved, I mean, to write and illustrate children's books, and I'm assuming it goes with everyone, you have to love kids. If you don't love kids and, the, and being able to communicate to them at their level so that they can understand it, whether they're reading it themselves or whether their parents or educators are reading it to them, 
so that they get an understanding and the colors that, you know, with any children's books that any children's uh, illustrator will use. And here, he's drawing a lion, which so happened to Horace Mann's mascot is the lion, Horace Mann Lions. And you just see the joy on his face and as well as the kids, although I had to blur them out for, you know, but he, it was just an honor to meet him that day and to speak with him. Not only myself got a chance to speak with him between, you know, classes, but as well as some of the other teachers and get insight because even as a fine artist painter myself, it's always great to find out and see how an artist approaches their work or their subject or what have you. As well as Horace Mann has campus, you know, in the uh, Riverdale section of the Bronx, they also have a nursery uh, division in the city. And it so happens, I was there twice, once on this past Friday and another about two weeks ago, and I just happened to see works of Jerry Pinckney up. And so happened, one of the uh, educators there said, I said, Jerry Pinckney, was he here? I said, I met him in 2014, blah, blah, blah. And they said, uh, the young lady said, I written to Jerry, and by when he got the letter, when the letter arrived, it was a day or two either before or after he passed away. So they wanted him to come to the Horace Mann Nursery as well. So it just shows the depth of how, you know, Horace Mann loved Jerry, and as well as you all this here. And I got a chance to meet his lovely wife for the first time today, which is an honor meeting you. And, you know, thank you all very much. And I think, is that all? Oh, sorry. And picture of lion, which is on exhibit out there. And some of his great drawings. So you can see the mastery in his work. And I will clearly put Jerry up there with all the other masters, whether it be Rembrandt's, Picasso's, uh, Bearden's, whoever you name them. He was up there with them as well. Thank you all very much. Hello, good to see you. How's that? Too much? Too little? Um, hi, Gloria. So, um, I think we're going to put up a picture in a moment, but I'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes. Um, I actually wrote a nice speech, but you're not going to hear it, because on my way down, uh, driving down, I said, you know, I've got, um, I've got some lovely video of Jerry speaking. And why should you all happen to listen to me when you can uh, hear some of him? So, uh, so I just I called the gallery and they uh, sent me down some uh, little clips of Jerry. So you get to hear from him himself, I think. Uh, that'll be more fun. Um, but I do promise you, I did write something nice. Uh, so, if, you know, if I were going to mention all of Jerry's awards, uh, we'd be here for hours and hours and hours. Um, I'm going to go really quick through a few of them because I should. Um, you know, he is the first black artist uh, to win a Caldecott medal on his, as a single uh, artist. Uh, he also has five Caldecott uh, honors, uh, I think five Coretta Scott King medals, uh, another five honors. I, some people actually think it's called the Coretta Scott King Jerry Pinckney Award, I think. Um, he has won it so often. Um, a Boston Horn, uh, a Horn Book Award. Uh, he was the United States nominee for the Hans Christian Andersen Illustration Award. The Society of Illustrators, four gold medals, silver, and their Lifetime Achievement Award also, uh, also elected into the Hall of Fame. Uh, the Laura Ingalls Wilder Medal uh, for substantial and lasting contribution to children's literature. Uh, the Virginia Hamilton Award for Lifetime Achievement. Uh, and um, the first uh, artist to have a full-scale retrospective at the uh, single artist at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, single living artist. Uh, beyond all that, I think that the most important thing to know about Jerry is he was literally the nicest person I ever met in my life. Uh, I represent uh, probably over 200 artists, uh, and 
well, you know, you have to be a bit of a psychiatrist. Um, and a lot of them have become good friends. Some of them are nice. Uh, but even if this room were filled with all the artists I represent, I would say that Jerry Pinckney is the nicest person I've ever met in my life. Um, and I have the honor of being in a gallery that always has his art on the walls. And I cannot tell you how often, every day, people don't only come up and look at the artwork, but they make a point of coming up to me and telling me how he influenced them in their life. Uh, and he did the same for me. Uh, you know, I think I'm a kinder person after meeting Jerry. Uh, I think I'm a more patient person after meeting Jerry. And, um, and I hear young illustrators all the time tell me, I, somebody told me just the other day that um, they went to their, uh, years back, they went to their very first children's book convention. And they were feeling totally lost. They didn't know anyone. They had just published their first book. They were excited to be there. Uh, and, but they were, you know, just nervous. And they were just standing there looking around, uh, you know, trying to figure out what to do. And the only person who came up to them was Jerry Pinckney who welcomed them, uh, you know, introduced them to some people, and took them around. They had never met him before, but he took them under his wing. And that is Jerry. I have a little clip. I, I actually didn't watch all of them. Um, yeah, we're going through, so now you see the whole thing. Um, but uh, uh, go back to the front, actually, and, and we'll do it later. But... Um, the, uh, where, where was I? Um, I got uh, distracted. But, uh, you know, Jerry, and you'll hear him talk a little bit about this, uh, as important as the artwork was to him, the community was as important. Uh, and he created a community wherever he went. Uh, and he would come to our shows every year at the gallery, he didn't need to be there. Uh, you know, I mean, a couple of times he needed to be there because he was being honored. But in general, he didn't need to be there. Uh, he took the time to show up, to mingle with everybody. Uh, he didn't need to still be doing how many school visits at, you know, at a point in his career that most people dial it down. For Jerry, it was, it, it was important to who he was, and he felt he needed to do that. Um, there was never any attitude. It was never, I'm Jerry Pinckney. Who are you? It was, who are you? I'm Jerry Pinckney. Um, and, you know, he was an amazing, amazing man. You'll see soon that his wife is also equally amazing. Um, one of the sad I was just thinking about this. One of the, the, the only sad thing in my life was Jerry and I never got to do a book together. Uh, and I, I wish we had. In fact, you don't, might not remember this, Gloria. Uh, you came up to me at a book. We were doing a book festival a few years back. And you were looking through my books. And you said, how come you do a book with E.B. Lewis? And you're doing a book with Eric Velasquez. How come you never done a book with Jerry? And I said, my dream in life is to do a book with Jerry. Um, but I would never ask him. I, I would, you know, I, first of all, I wouldn't ask one of my artists to illustrate one of my books because that puts them in a funny position. Um, you know, what if they don't want to? Um, and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, he's Jerry Pinckney. Even, as, even when we were friends, he was still... Jerry Pinkney, you don't approach him. But you gave me the courage to do so. And, uh, and I sent Jerry a manuscript. And he, uh, he read it. And he uh, called me. He said, I would love to do this. I really like it. Um, he said, but more importantly, and I don't know that I've ever told you that. He said, Gloria read it. And she said, you should do it. And I thank you. Uh, unfortunately, it won't happen. Um, we lost Jerry. I had no idea how uh, ill he was. He, we, we were planning a show, and he called me uh, 
um, and to talk about the show. And I only found out later that he called me from the hospital. Uh, and he was talking about what we were going to you know, exhibit, what he was going to bring by. I had no idea he was in the hospital. Um, later in the day, I happened to be on the phone with Brian Collier, another great illustrator who Jerry influenced, uh, when I got a call. And it said, Jerry Pinckney on my phone. And I said to Brian, you know, I'd love to talk to you, but hey, Jerry's on the phone. Um, and I hooked up, and it was Gloria um, telling me that Jerry had passed. Uh, it was great sadness. Do you have the little clicker? I'm just going to pass through it because I don't want to talk too long. So, if, so um, that's, that's my gallery, actually. And we do an illustration show every year. Um, and I just it, we added this because, you know, you see Jerry and Gloria there. This is Julius Lester also, who uh, works with Gloria. If you, this is a who's who of uh, illustrators. Um, and uh, you probably, I'm not going to bother going through everyone, but, uh, but they're all there. Uh, we do this every year. Uh, Je this is um, a year that Jerry got an award. There's Mo Willems at the far end. Uh, I, I thought Barbara McClintock was going to be here because it works there, so they put in a little picture of her peeking over the shoulder. Everybody wants to be in the picture with Jerry. Uh, every year he would show. This is Jerry was talking. You'll hear him talk later. You'll see the audience reaction. Um, I mean, uh, it's just... Everybody listening, and Tony Dieterlisi is in there. Uh, I see Mark Brown, Jared Krasowska. Uh, there's Florence Miner. I don't know who's there. Uh, Gloria, in 2015, Jerry brought Brian to the gallery. That was uh, and when we first started handling his work. And Raul Cologne, many of you saw, was in the gallery earlier. Uh, and there's Gloria. She always looks lovely. Uh, next year he showed up, the next year, the next year. Uh, the great pleasure of my life was, uh, was um, last, uh, the summer of 2021, when Jerry and Gloria came to visit me, and we spent a, almost a week on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, and while Jerry and I often had dinner and hung out together, um, this was a great sustained time where I really got to you know, we didn't talk about business, and we didn't talk about, and we talked about life. And, um, you know, I, I remember um, you all, you and Jerry had gone out to eat, and you weren't sure how to get back to your place, and I said I would come and draw you back. And this is just an example of who Jerry is and who Gloria is. So um, at the kind of time when a normal couple would be done eating dinner. Uh, I went to uh, see them, at, you know, to walk them back. And uh, Jerry was deep in conversation with the waitress uh, and asking her questions about her life and talking. You know, I went back uh, to my cottage. I showed up 45 minutes later, still in conversation. Um, Everybody was important to, to uh, Jerry and to Gloria. Um, walking around the town with you all, uh, it was amazing to me how many people you all reached out to, you know, and got to know. Uh, and uh, you know, and we don't do that. We're all in a hurry. We're walking, right? You know, you got to get someplace. They walk, and if somebody passes, they say hi. It's just lovely. Um, there they are with me and my wife in front of our cottage. I love this picture, the two of them. Isn't that, isn't that absolutely gorgeous? Um, it, it's, you know, uh, my wife uh, would say to me, we should have a marriage like that. <laughs> uh, not everybody can. Um, so this is, how do I uh, do this or can you do it? I think, and um, 
Rich has this way of, of after the event taking photographs, and I've always been in them. It was kind of weird, because I wasn't in the exhibition, but there I was smiling, uh, drinking wine, and having a good time. And he's right, he's been after me for a while. And I think um, there, there are two factors here that are both, I think, equally important. One is I wasn't sure about how the handle of this body would work. And I certainly wanted it wherever it was going to go, that I felt that the person on the other end exhibiting it and, and putting the work out there had to have a similar, similar passion. And I hadn't found that over the years. And I might have been just a little gun shy because I've been a few galleries, they've been okay, but I wanted something more. And I think it was about matching what I was beginning to think about myself. And I say beginning to think about myself. And there was a, 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 a I came up with some work. No, we met at the, at, uh, the Norman Rockwell. We had dinner there. Exactly. And through the conversation, um, there was something starting to happen. Something that started to make me feel good and better. Then there was a trip up to visit with some work. And, um, and then again, another lunch. We do a lot of that kind of stuff, um, eating. Um, but it was at that point I thought that, you know what? Um, uh, there's something happening here. Not only uh, a respect, but a trust. Um, but there's a kind of a, a kinship. And a lot of the story, the, the, the conversation was about stories about each other. And I thought, you know, this guy is not only interested in the work, but he's also interested in me. And I think that did it. So I, I want to, first of all, he said some nice things about me, so I wanted to put it in. But, um, but more, I wanted to show that um, Jerry came up to give a talk about himself. And he spent his time talking about me, gallery. If this went on, you would hear him give a little story about almost every illustrator he saw in the audience. He didn't get around to talking about himself. Um, and uh, and he, is, he is right. Um, because of my gallery, I, I get inundated all the time with illustrators, et cetera, and it's hard to, Jerry is the only person uh, that I can think of that I actively pursued. Um, and it took years. And it wasn't about the art, it was only when we became friends. Uh, and that was what was important to him. Uh, if I'm gonna, the next one's just a minute and then we're gonna. Get And um, how do you feel about that? And I said, so it was great. I mean, you heard me up here talk about what I think of Rich in the gallery. So I was thinking about my remarks, and, um, and I couldn't get away from the cliche of um, the metaphor of icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. I, I was speaking to someone, and I said, you know, this is what it's all about. Can you believe this? This is community. And they said, well, really, it's about the art. And I thought, whoa, wait a minute. Isn't that, it's all of that? It's all of that. It's this sense that we are together. And there is such energy in the gatherings um, that we have um, that's so, so powerful. Get this. I get up in the morning. For 50 years, I get to do something I love. I make marks on the paper. Those marks turn into a book. That book could possibly change the child's life. At least getting them started about thinking about art. I get to do this every day. And then I get to be here tonight with so many names I can name over and over again in relationship to a conversation or just being together. You know what? It is the icing on the cake. 
Thank you. Gloria. Thank you, Rich. Well, hello, everybody. As you know, I'm Gloria Jean Pinkney, and Jerry Pinkney was my love, and I was his love. Jerry and I were together 64 years. That's a long time. We were married 61, and we dated three years in high school. I'd like to tell you a few things that no one has mentioned, all right, since you've heard a lot of the same things over and over again. Certainly, he was a great guy. He was a wonderful human being. He loved people. He loved children. He loved communicating. He loved being able to contribute. But none of, no one mentioned his struggle. Jerry had dyslexia, serious dyslexia. When he was in school, he didn't know how to read when the other children knew how to read. They put him in special classes. And unfortunately, in those years, no one understood dyslexia. And he'd put, they'd put him in a special class where children were acting out. And he would just sit there and watch all of this. He didn't participate and wonder why he was there. I'm going to back up and tell you a little bit about his mother. He loved his mother. And she would often tell the story about um, Jerry was very different. He was one of six children. He had, there were three boys and three girls. He was the youngest boy. And um, everybody in his family was a talker. They had a lot of things to say. And they all talked at the same time, and they still do. All right. But Jerry was very quiet, and he would, they had a piano. Funny, his father was a jack of all trades who painted the piano pink. And Jerry would get under the pink piano and draw and went from a little guy. His mom said he was around three years old, and there he was, Jerry, where are you? And I had to tell you, he used to get embarrassed when I'd tell this. His answer was, here I is, <laughs> under the piano drawing. He loved to draw that he made the drawing pad his world. He loved to draw, and he drew all the time. And yet, with all the drawing, drawing that Jerry did, he had, he never ever neglected his family or friends. If someone called him on the phone, they were able to reach him, and he would talk to them. Sometimes it was artists, other times it was people just in the neighborhood. But whenever anyone needed to talk to someone, they would call Jerry, and he would take the time to talk to them. Um, I want to also say this, that um, Jerry grew up at a time when there were not many um, Afri African Americans in the field. When I met Jerry, the first time I saw him was in high school, and he was walking down the aisle of the lunchroom, and he had a big drawing pad under his arm in the lunchroom, and he had his sleeves rolled up. I remember he had on a green shirt, sleeves were all rolled up, very starched, and a pencil behind his ear. Why? Because he intended to do some drawings in the lunchroom. He was always drawing. And yet, he always took time for others. Like, he loved his great-granddaughter, Zion. And I have many pictures of Jerry. I don't care how hard he was working or what he was working on. He'd drop everything when she'd come and take her out. Take her out in the snow. There are many pictures of him pulling her around in the, in the snow. Um, they had a, a beautiful, beautiful relationship. And of course, she's missing him. And I'm missing him. Now, I want to say this, that when Jerry was in the hospital, he had been, he, the two of us had been working on his memoir. He had had several people before me trying to put together his memoir, but no one was able to capture his voice. So finally, one day, I said, why don't I try? So we sat down for a year working on his memoir. We finished it in the hospital. It'll be out. It'll be in the stores in January. The title is called Just Jerry. I feel very pleased to say that I came up with the title. And the editors were not pleased with this title. But I knew it was the right title, and I had to do something. I had to demonstrate why. When Jerry took me to meet his mother when I was 15 years old, I asked his mother why, out of her six children, was Jerry the only one who didn't have a formal name or a middle name? Her reply was, just Jerry's enough. He's going to make something of that name. Was she ever right? She, and she lived to see that happen. And that is a beautiful thing. And, and so did his dad. Jerry's main concern, besides making art, was to talk to children who have learning disabilities. That's something no one talked about, learning disabilities. 
that no matter how difficult it is for you, no matter how, what a difficult time he had reading, that you should never give up and keep trying. Jerry had a library, over a thousand books. I'm trying to figure out now what to do about all these books that he has. Everywhere you look, there are books, you know, because he loved to read, and it would take him a long time to read. He'd have to read things over and over again, because that dyslexia was something that really plagued him all of his life. And it's interesting because I came across one of his um, journals today, and I was reading it, and there were so many misspellings in that book. I have to get, <laughs> really study it, see what he was saying because he still was having that problem. But yet, when he would go out to communicate, you know, and make a speech, he didn't have that difficulty at all. Why? Because he spoke from the heart. Everything he did was from the heart. Um, I called the hospital recently because um, when Jerry went in, I had no idea that he would never come out. However, he did say to me, I think I'm going to be here a long time. He did say that. And he was drawing in the hospital. Somehow his doctor never saw him drawing. And what happened is, I wanted to find out a little more about his passing. So I called the hospital, and the doctor called me back. She had no idea he was an artist. He never mentioned it to anyone. How could that be? He was so humble. Jerry won so many awards. You know where Jerry's awards are? In a trunk. He packed them all away in a trunk. Isn't that something? Now I won a few awards, too, with my writing. And, uh, and, I, and I decided that I would put mine in the trunk. Then I decided to pull mine out, because I don't have that many, <laughs> and put them on the wall. But his are in the trunk. In the trunk. That's how humble he was. He had so much humility, but yet he wanted to leave a legacy. And he told me that. But the legacy that he wanted to leave was that no matter how difficult life is, or whatever your challenges are, you can still be successful. When Jerry was in high school, and knew that he wanted to be an artist. His teacher, and he, he was an A student. Matter of fact, he was an A student with wings. He was so proud of that. His teacher had, uh, the city of Philadelphia was giving out three scholarships that year. His teacher decided not to give any of the application blanks to the black students. He was a wonderful teacher, but he didn't think that they would be able to make a living. Mr. Pinckney, Mr. Jerry Pinckney, went downstairs to the counselor's office and got those forms, gave one to his best friend, and the two of them won scholarships to Philadelphia College of Art. Yes, he did that on his own. And um, I'm so pleased to say that Jerry has a painting hanging in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. You know, one of his paintings is there. He had a lot of beautiful things happening, like um, he was also a NASA artist at one point, and he has uh, uh, artwork hanging in the uh, museum, in the Air and Space Museum. Okay, in, in, I believe it's not in Washington, but yeah. And he also got to be um, uh, an artist for the White House. And we were very privileged to spend time with uh, Laura Bush. And if any of you would like to see some really good interviews of Jerry, you can go online. There are so many there, so many interviews. And I am a writer of spiritual works, all right? And I want to tell you my latest story about Jerry. This is a funny one. It makes people laugh, and I want to leave you laughing. Here it is. Oh, and incidentally, I've had many encounters with Jerry since he's passed, and I'm writing about them. They have happened. I have evidence that they happened. If anybody wants to look, I can show you some things on my um, phone that have happened. But here's the last one. Uh, I was with the family in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And why there? Because they're in Philly, and we could meet. And I was sitting on the boardwalk, and I was um, watching the couples walk by. And of course, I started thinking about how many times Jerry and I would hold hands walking. And I decided I would look and see if there was a new interview, that one, an interview that I hadn't seen yet. And I found one where Jerry was interviewing, and he said, Gloria was the first woman that I ever loved. And when I heard it, I thought, hmm, well, who was the second woman? <laughs> who was the last woman that he loved? You got to remember, I'm a writer now. OK. Well, that night, I went to sleep. And Mr. Jerry Pinkney walked up to me in a dream. And he kissed, he hugged me first, long time. Now, that's the second time this has happened. Uh, the first time was in our kitchen. And, and then he kissed me for a long time. And then he backed away from me and said, I love you, OK? <laughs> and I woke up. Now, I can't believe I do this every time I leave off the best part of this story. I was fasting at the time. I was actually fasting for my great, our great granddaughter who has a, lear a learning who's learning disabled. And I was looking for a school for her. 
Incidentally, that just came through last week. I was fascinated about this particular school. And uh, so I had given up tea. Why? Because I drink a lot of tea, all right? At least four or five cups of tea a day. So I figured that's what I would give up, right? That's an important to the story. So when he said, I love you, okay? So I woke up, and I didn't get a chance to answer him, but I heard music. I heard music. Jerry loved jazz. Ella Fitzgerald singing, from this moment on, you for me, dear. We are two for tea, dear. Two for tea, dear? Now, I didn't hear two for tea, dear. I just heard from this moment on. So I said, I need to Google this song. So I Googled the song, and the second line was about two for tea. Remember, I'm going tea fast? All right. So then I listened to the whole song, where she's singing about how I love your hugs, and I love your kisses, and you know, yeah. All this happened. This is one of the stories that's going in the book I'm working on right now. It happened. And then I told a friend of mine this story. And oh, I went home to look at his jazz collection. And I found um, a CD by Ella Fitzgerald. But it was yellow, which I wrote in my book. I wrote the book on Holy Spirit about yellow being a color of hope. But the song wasn't there. So I'm talking to my girlfriend on the phone. And she says, Gloria, I think I have that CD. Well, she found it. And she brought it to me. It's a pink CD, P-I-N-K, like P-I-N-K-N-E-Y, all right? Not only is the cover pink, the inside, the CD itself is pink. And what's the first song on it? From this moment on. And what's right here? Wow, I just dropped it. I didn't put this here. OK. I write about signs, wonders, and miracles. Here's a pink paper clip. Glad I told you that story. Thank you for listening. Everyone who spoke today and everyone who has come to celebrate the lives and art of Susan Jeffers, Ted Lewis, and Jerry Pinkney. Please join us in the gallery just across the hall. You can savor their art once again and other examples of storybook animals. And some fine food and drink accompanies the fine art there as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.